Thanks for tuning in to our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more information on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at ccoceancity.com. Today, we have guest speaker and former professional boxer, Ebo Elder, sharing a message he calls the Great Comeback. Tonight, we have a guest with us, and we're going to open up with a video very quickly. Um, his name is Ebo Elder. Um, I usually introduce people that you might not have met before as my friend, but this is more than my friend. Uh, Ebo Elder is a boxer who has boxed with Mayweather. If you know who Mayweather is, most of you should. He's the highest paid athlete, I think, right now still in the world. And uh, what you're going to watch right now is a clip when Ebo was on Showtime and he was actually boxing an individual who was number four in the world ranked. So take a moment and take a look at this. Elder with a left, another left. Crowd standing up, a lot of people here. It's a sellout crowd, Santa Yadez. Final round. Watch your hit, come on, come on. And goes orthodox. Trying to unzip Elder. Find those openings. Set round seven, eight, nine. I thought Burton was slowing down. He really came on. I thought he took the last two. And it's a good thing that the way he is. so funny. What is so funny? Did you hear, did you hear the guy on the, uh, on the commentator? He says, he says, Ebo's praying to God right now, but he should be praying for his opponent. Two minutes later, Ebo's praying for his opponent. Is that cool or what? Um, Pete Magazoo said that if he was to lose his voice, he would like to lose it in worship. If I'm going to lose my head, I would like to lose it to Ebo Elder. <laughs> Watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, Ebo Elder.
Thank you, Pastor Matt. You guys, man, are you excited to be in church tonight? Do you know that God wants to work in your life tonight? Do you know that he wants to transform your life tonight? No matter where you're at in your walk, you might be a, a, a two-day-old Christian, or you might have been walking with the Lord for 60 years. Either way, the Lord wants to transform your life tonight. Can I get an amen? amen. He wants to transform it. I love Genesis again. Sorry for the breathing deep. I'm not in boxing shape anymore here. Getting it back. But in Genesis 18, Abraham, the Lord appears to him. He's at the gate, the door of his tent. And it says he looks up and he sees the Lord. And what does he do? He runs to meet him. He goes to God with expectancy, knowing that the Lord has good plans for his life, knowing that God wants to work in his life, knowing that God's going to do something radical and transform his life. I think we need to go to God with expectancy, amen? amen? He also humbles himself and he bows down before the Lord. He goes before the Lord with expectancy and with humility. That's my prayer tonight for us, that we would go before the Lord right now, knowing he wants to work in our lives, knowing he wants to transform us and to conform us to the image of his son and come humbly knowing that we need him to do a great work, amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you so much for our time together tonight. Lord, this is a privilege to be able to come before you, to worship you, to share of the good news, to share of your power and your faithfulness and your great love for us. What a privilege, Lord, to be, to be here together in fellowship with one another. Lord, we ask you to meet us in this place. We invite you in tonight. Transform our lives. Change us, Lord, from the inside out. That we would be more like your son, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, awesome to be here with you guys. I didn't totally expect to hit pads tonight, but that was a little bit of fun. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the fight clip as well? Amen. Good, good, good. Well, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. It's on the screen in a moment. It says, for though a righteous man falls seven times. I don't like that. <laughs> even though it could be read, even though a righteous man falls seven times. I don't want to fall. I don't want to get knocked down. But doesn't it happen? Doesn't it rain on the just and the unjust? Didn't Jesus say, in this world you will have tribulation? Didn't he say that in this world we're going to experience persecution for our faith and difficulty and adversity? Yes, he did. But even though a righteous man or woman falls seven times, what does it say? He will get up. He will get up. Look at your neighbor and say, you will get up. Do better this time and look at your other neighbor and say, you will get up. And they look at me and say, I will get up. He will get up. As a Christ follower, as a Christian, we might get knocked down, but we are never knocked out. We're not out. For though a righteous man or woman falls seven times, they rise again. You might be knocked down right now. I know a lot of people that are on the mat that are ready to throw in a towel, that are ready to give up. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there right now. You got a bad report from the doctor. Your marriage is falling apart. You got a prodigal son or prodigal daughter. You just lost your job. You don't know how you're gonna make ends meet financially. You don't know what you're gonna do. You're suffering from anxiety. You're suffering from depression. All kind of stuff's going wrong in your life and you're down on the mat and you wanna give up. You wanna throw in the towel and you say, I can't do it anymore. I want to encourage you tonight. I believe the one true and living God has a great comeback in store for you. I believe it. He's got a great comeback in store for you. Why do I say a great comeback? Because God's not into good comebacks. He's not into okay comebacks. He's not into mediocre comebacks. God is the God of the great comeback. 
That's his style. That's the way he rolls. That's the way he operates. God is the God of the great comeback. And if you look through the scriptures, man, the scriptures are packed with great comebacks, full of great comebacks from the beginning to the end. Take Joseph from the pit to the palace. Think about Lazarus. That's a good comeback, right? From the tomb. <laughs> you know, from the tomb. And it already, it says, <laughs> Mary's like, Lord, it already stinketh in there, you know? And, and Jesus is like, it don't matter. <laughs> Get up, come out, Lazarus. And, and Lazarus raised from the dead. You know, I love the great comeback of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If I had time, we could go through that. But these three young Hebrew men, get an ultimatum from Nebuchadnezzar to bow to a giant golden statue he's created or they're gonna be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. What do they do? They put their confidence in the one true and living God. They say, hey, God can deliver us and even if he doesn't, we ain't gonna serve nobody else. Verse 18, Daniel chapter three, I love that. Basically, they said, look, we don't serve God because of what he can do for us, we serve him because he's God. Can I get an amen? Look, that's the only good reason to serve God because of who he is. Not, not your circumstances. And your circumstances might seem bleak today. They're better than you deserve, but they might seem bleak. And you might say, I don't see any circumstances that you know, would, 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 would cause me to serve God. I urge you to look back 2,000 years ago. Look back 2,000 years ago to the cross at Calvary. The only reliable indicator of Jesus' love for you is what he did on the cross. Your circumstances are not reliable indicators. They are not. But the cross of Calvary proves that while we were still sinners, he died for us and he loves us. Not that he first loved, that we first loved him. He first loved us. Amen? Amen. Maybe you feel like you're on the mat and you're going to give up. God's got a great comeback in store for you. And they're all through the scriptures. The fight you just saw right there, that was a great comeback in my boxing career. That was against Courtney Burton. He was ranked number four in the world at the time. It's real interesting. About a year and a half before that fight, I was out of boxing. God had brought my career to an end two years earlier. And, uh, and I remember I rarely watched boxing, but I happened to catch a boxing match one time. Just, I caught a piece of it and it got my attention, so I started watching it. And I saw Courtney Burton destroy a guy named Angel Man Freddy. Walk through him like a wet paper bag. I'm talking serious. And I saw that. I didn't know the Lord and I wasn't even in boxing at the time, but I cried out and I said, if I ever have to fight again, God, don't make me fight that guy. <laughs> a couple months later, God opened my eyes to the truth of the gospel. He saved me. He radically intervened into my life called me back into boxing, not for myself anymore, but all for him. 10 months later, I'm fighting the number four fighter in the world, that guy that I prayed, don't make me face him. <laughs> it's as if God wanted me to face my greatest fears, to show his power and to show his faithfulness. Now in this fight, we're gonna see what it takes to make it to our great comeback. How many of you need a great comeback? I mean, you might have to think about it a second if things are going good, but just give it time, okay? <laughs> you're gonna need a great comeback sooner or later. Maybe you're a baby Christian. Give it five minutes. You're gonna need a great comeback, okay? <laughs> Be patient. How do we make it to our great comeback? How do we get there? Well, you know, as Jesus taught in parables in the gospels, you know, he would take a natural occurrence to, to explain a spiritual truth. And he did the same thing with my boxing career and many of my fights. He would use these boxing matches to explain spiritual truth to me. And sometimes it was easier than others, right? But he would explain these things. And in this fight, I got, tonight for you, I have three points of how to make it to your great comeback. So I go into the ring with Courtney Burton, 12 rounds ahead of us. From the moment I signed the contract and how it came about, Showtime sent us a list of prospective opponents. They said, we want you to fight on our network. You're exciting to watch, you throw lots of punches and you bleed a lot and we happen to like that because it's good for the ratings. It's the curse of the white man. 
So they sent us a list of prospective opponents. We looked it over and we knew, I knew what God was calling me to. He was calling me to, me to something bigger than me. He was calling me to something outside of my abilities and my, my, my strength and my courage. And he's calling you to the same thing. Do you know that? He's calling you to something bigger than you. And I knew that. So we told Showtime, look, these are good fighters, but I can beat all these guys. We want you to get us the toughest fight you can possibly get us. Go to the champion and challenge him. If you can't hit, get him, go to the next guy. If you can't get him, go to the next guy. They, did, they, they challenged the top three guys in the world. They wouldn't accept the fight. Good for them because they knew what was going to happen. Just kidding. But they get to number four ranked Courtney Burton, and he accepted the fight. And I go into that fight in San Inez, California, live showbox television. I go into the ring 12 rounds ahead of me. And in the second round, I was confident. I knew God was with me. How many of you know that when you know God's with you, you got nothing to worry about? Nothing. Your, your life might look like a train wreck right now, but I'm going to quote a good friend of mine, Stuart Migdon. He said, Ebo. If you're fully surrendered to God, it doesn't matter where you're going, it's the right way. Bank on that. If you're fully surrendered to Jesus, it doesn't matter where you're going, it's the right direction. But I knew, I knew that God was with me in this fight. I had complete, God gave me the gift of faith. I knew I was going to win. I knew it. I told everybody, look, this is, this is part of God's plan for my life. This is not a regular boxing match. This was sovereignly orchestrated by the living God before time began. Say something like that at a press conference and see what, <laughs> it's interesting. And they're like, what are you talking about? You, I might be crazy, but I'm right. But I had absolute faith I was going to win. I knew it. I go into this boxing match. We didn't, lots of things to tell about this, but I just, I knew this night was part of God's plan for my life. I knew God was with me. I knew I was going to win. But in the, by the second round, very early on, I began to realize some startling information. I was in way over my head. <laughs> I was in trouble, big trouble. Look, <laughs> look, I'm not even joking. Courtney's throwing punches, and I'm like, this dude is strong. And hey, we're getting in clinches, and I'm like, this dude is mean. He hates me. He wants to kill me. And, and he can do it. Look, I knew I was in way over my head. I, I, I knew it. And the only thing I knew to do, look, if you're in trouble, this is the only good thing to do. Call upon Jesus. Call upon Jesus. Doesn't matter if you have cell service, you always got service with him. Amen. Call upon Jesus, man. I cried out to God and I said, Lord God, this fight that you've called me to tonight, it's going to be painful. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be difficult, Lord. And I admitted my weakness. I said, Jesus, I'm going to want to quit. I knew I would. I don't have the goods, man. I'm, little, I'm just a little, little dude that grew up on a gravel road in Palmetto, Georgia. I'm nobody. I said, Lord, I don't have what it takes to win this fight. I don't have the goods, and I'm going to want to quit. But God spoke back to me with, with love and power and authority. And he said, Ebo, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. If you don't quit, if you persevere, if you press on, I'll do what you can't do. Look, guys, perseverance, point number one tonight. You want to make it to your great comeback? Perseverance is essential. Perseverance. It's not going to be easy. The Christian walk is not easy. It's not easy to live for Jesus. It sure ain't easy to live without him either. Life just isn't easy. My English teacher in 10th grade said, Ebo, life's hard, then you die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're such an optimist. I love it. No, look, look, life's hard. It's a, it's a battle, man. You are, you, when you became a Christian, you didn't get on a, a cruise line. You got on a battleship, right? We're in a war. We are in a battle. As Paul would tell the young Timothy, Timothy, fight the good fight. 
Don't just think you can sit back and relax and kind of autopilot into heaven. It ain't going to happen, buddy, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. We are in a spiritual battle. It is a fight, and you must persevere. You want to make it to your great comeback? Point number one, you must persevere. God said, Ebo, if you don't give up, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. So I knew I had to persevere. But when I heard that, immediately I was filled with joy because I knew I was going to win. Not only would I win, but I knew I was going to win by knockout. And I knew it would be a knockout because, look, in all my experience, I've never seen God leave the decision up to the judges. <laughs> That's not his style. He just doesn't do it, right? I knew it would be a knockout. But Ebo wanted the knockout to be quick and easy. All right, Lord, come on. Here we go. Knockout victory. It's going to be awesome, man. I've been talking about it for months. Yeah, here we go. Do it through a little jab. It'll be miraculous. Pow. Come on, just a tiny jab. It'll, it'll give you more glory. Come on. Boom. Come on, Lord. Then I resorted to, okay, maybe a left hand. All right, here we go. A little bit of power. Bang. Come on, Lord. Come on. Bang. And then I began to encourage the creator of the universe. Come on, Jesus, you can do it. Come on. <laughs> I wanted the victory quick and easy. Look, <laughs> we are in a battle. You are on, you are, if you have given your life to Jesus, you are in God's army. This is not for the faint of heart. You say, well, I'm weak. Yeah, but he's strong. You say, I don't have courage. But yeah, he is courage. You say, I don't have faith. Well, he is faith. He'll give you everything you need. And when you can't do it, if you just don't quit, he'll do what you can. Well, as the fight progressed in the fourth round, Courtney hit me with a big right hand right here. Broke my jaw. You saw it all swollen up right there. I right? broken jaw. Go on a little further, round six or seven. I got hit with a body shot so hard it caused my kidneys to start hemorrhaging. I was internally bleeding. A little further, my eyes start to swell shut. Cuts over both of them, bleeding everywhere, right? After the ninth round, you ought to watch it on YouTube uh, if you're not squeamish or whatever. But right after the ninth round, the bell rings, ding, boom, hit me with an uppercut. I was just rock, man. I'm stumbling back to my corner. After the 11th round, I had nothing left, <laughs> nothing left. And my, my trainer in the corner is, is prayed. We gave up on fancy footwork. We gave up on hand speed. We gave up on combinations because I had, once again, nothing left. We decided to call upon the Lord again. He said, Lord, give him strength to do whatever he has to do. That's interesting, right? I don't think he exactly knew why at the time, but he prayed that because we didn't have any idea what I had to do. Listen, I really thought I was going to have to die in the 12th round and I'd be resurrected from the dead right there in showtime. <laughs> no, you laugh. That's not a joke. I mean it. I really thought I had to die. You can laugh. It's okay. But look, I thought I would have to die in the 12th round and I was ready, man. I thought if I got to die, I got to die. Jesus raised some people from the dead 2,000 years ago. He can do it again. I was ready to die if I had to die. But I didn't know what God was going to do. Give me strength to do whatever, whatever I've got to do because I don't know what you're going to do. I didn't know what he was going to do in the 12th round. But look, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We have to trust he's going to meet us in the 12th round. Look, we live in the 11th round rest. This is where we exist tonight. You might not feel like it's rest, and in some ways it's not, but anyway, you're in the 11th round rest as far as this uh, analogy goes. We got to go. We got to keep fighting. We got to keep going. We don't get to see what God does in the 12th round, but I assure you, he will meet you there. He will meet you there. And another thing, look, God will reward your commitment to him today, tomorrow. He will reward your commitment to him this week Next week, he rewarded my diligence in that boxing match in the 11th round. He rewarded it in the 12th round. It's the principle of reaping and sowing, man. You always reap what you sow. You always reap after you sow. And you always reap more than you sow. I went fast through that. Bank on it. <laughs> no, seriously. 
God will reward your commitment tonight. You're, you're uh, crying out to him tonight. He'll reward it tomorrow. That's the way he works. Yeah. Reaping and sowing. I knew I couldn't quit. I knew I couldn't give up. I had to go into that last round and I had to give it my all. I go into the 12th round. Three minutes to go. Piece of cake, right? You can do anything for three minutes. Well, a minute and a half into it, I, I'm not one to pace myself. A minute and a half into it, Courtney, I was exhausted. Courtney hit me with a big right hand. I was hurt. I fell back into the ropes. As I fell back, my instinct was to fight, man. The eye of the tiger would not relent. My arm was held back by a rope, though. You just saw it. As I threw it, it held my arm back, and everything drained out of me. And I started to go down. And the commentator was like, what's Ebo doing with his head down? I'm like, I tell you what I'm doing. I'm thinking. Give me a break. <laughs> it's an interesting place to ponder, but I was, actually. I was like, what do I do? You know, look, I knew at that moment I was going down. If I could even get up, I was about to get knocked out. I knew it. It wasn't, I think I'm going to get knocked out. It was like, look, I got nothing left. Courtney's knocking me out. I know it. So all I knew to do, man, was to cry out to Jesus again. I said, Lord, it's about to be over. I got nothing left. I, I can't do it. It's about to be over. I'm about to be knocked out. But I didn't quit. I didn't quit. Lord, not only did I not quit, but since you made that promise to me in the second round, guess what? And of course, God knew this. You guys can guess what? <laughs> I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about quitting since the second round. I haven't allowed it to enter my mind. You know, Jesus said to take your thoughts captive. Guys, point number two on how you make it to your great comeback. First, we must persevere. Second, we need to have a right perspective. A right perspective. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as a man or a woman thinks in their heart, so are they. We don't think with our heart, do we? Hmm. We think with our mind. But the more we think on things, if we don't take unrighteous and untrue thoughts captive, they get implanted in our heart and they'll dictate who we are and the lifestyle we live. They will. We got to take those thoughts captive. We got to have after the renewing of our mind through the washing of the water of the word. We got we to gotta quit agreeing with lies from the enemy. How many of you can say the enemy lies to me all the time? He is a deceiver. He is the father of lies. And that is one of his major tools against us. He, he puts lies in our mind, lies in our mind. And the problem happens when we start to agree with the lie. We need a right perspective. How do we have a right perspective? We align our thought life. We align our belief system. We align it with the word of God. It's a perseverance and perspective. I said, Lord, I haven't thought about quitting. I'm not going to think about it now. So I gathered together everything I possibly could, just enough to stand up. And as soon as I stood up, something amazing happened. Power power from on high came into my body. The commentator noticed it. He said, Ebo's got a, a burst of steam. <laughs> Come on, man. Burst of steam. Are you serious? <laughs> what he perceived as a burst of steam was in fact the Holy Spirit empowering me. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we need perseverance, perspective, and power. Look, man, what do you need to live the life God's called you to live? Live. What do you need to be a man of God or a woman of God, to be a godly husband and father and mother and student and remain pure and devoted to God and set apart for his plans? What do you need? You need power. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to the believer at every moment. Isn't that amazing? The same power. Look, we have no excuse. No excuse because the power is available to us, man. Dunamis power. That's where we get the word dynamite. Dynamic, dynamos. It's dunamis power available to us. How do we receive it? By faith. 
Same way you receive your salvation. Luke chapter 14 says, if God, or if we being evil inherently, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more so will the heavenly father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Right. Now in that case, I didn't have to ask. God's like, I'm gonna give you something you need, but uh, you get the point. Lord, give me power. Give me power, give me strength. And receive it by faith. So we need perseverance, we need perspective, and we need power. The Holy Spirit came upon me. My punches began to land perfectly with precision and power. And 30 seconds later, the number four fighter in the world was knocked out. Under my own strength and my own abilities, I was going to suffer a devastating defeat. Under the power, under the leading of God and the power of God, I would in fact experience my greatest victory. Guys, <laughs> we need the power of God. We need to be led by the Spirit. The Bible says that the sons and daughters of God, you'll know you're a son or daughter of God because you are led by the Spirit of God. I was empowered by the Spirit and led by the Spirit. It's interesting. Right after that happened, all I could do was worship. Did you notice that? Amen. That's all I could do, man. I didn't have a worship leader encourage me. We raised holy hands. I didn't have a song. I was in a casino in California in a boxing match. But I couldn't do anything but praise God. Why? Because I got a glimpse of the one true and living God. <laughs> like the woman who got a, a fistful of robe, you know, grabbed Jesus' robe. Well, man, I grabbed hold of his robe and held on for dear life, man. I got a glimpse of God like never before. I saw his goodness, his faithfulness, his generosity, his mercy, his grace. I saw his plans for each and every one of us and it blew me away. And all I could do was worship. And then the commentators were jeering me, you heard it. It's good that Ebo prays, but he needs to pray for his opponent. I, like Matt, Pastor Matt said, I didn't hear that, but God did. So great, man. I go over, I get on one knee with Courtney. Lord, make this loss for him a benefit like you did for me three and a half years earlier. That he'll know nothing of this world means anything. Only a relationship with, with you, with his father, with the spiritual, with God. Only a relationship. And nothing else satisfies. Guys, I'm here to tell you, if you're looking anywhere outside of a relationship with Jesus for satisfaction, you will not find it. Can I get an amen? amen? You won't find it. Colossians chapter two, verse 10 says, you are complete in Christ Jesus. That's the only way you're gonna be complete or satisfied or fulfilled permanently is in Christ Jesus. That's the only way. But that night, man, that night was an amazing night in my career. God showed me so much through that boxing match. And that was the greatest comeback of my boxing career. Not the greatest comeback of my life, however. I've had lots of comebacks. I remember the first day of 10th grade, well, I got a good memory for a boxer, it's amazing. But um, first day of 10th grade, I'm sitting in Mr. Sullivan's geometry class, trailer number three, two rows over, sitting about five seats back. That's a good memory. I remember it because a girl walked in class. It's always the girl, right? This girl walks in class. Her name was Amy, Amy White. I hadn't seen her since elementary school. We were friends in first through fourth grade. We didn't go to the same middle school. We didn't see each other in our ninth grade year, but that first day of 10th grade, she walks in. I make the seat next to me openly available. And she comes and sits down. We start talking and soon after that, we started dating, went, dated all through high school, went to both proms together, graduated high school, and we had a perfect future planned out. We we're gonna get married. We got married three weeks after graduation. 18 years old, perfect future planned out. We're gonna have tons of kids. We actually named all of our kids in high school. That's nuts, okay? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> we named our kids, we had it all planned out. I'm gonna be a pro boxer, she's gonna be a stay at home mom. We're gonna grow old together. We had this perfect future planned out, but listen, we knew God had a call in our life. We knew it. We knew Jesus had a plan for us, Ephesians 2.10. Uh, we are his workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that were prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. We knew he had a plan for us. We knew it. 
but we would not yield to it. We wanted to do what we wanted to do. We thought we had a better plan than God. We thought we knew a better way. So we did our thing. We resisted the Holy Spirit and we did our thing and it allowed Satan to get a foothold in our lives. A year and a half into our marriage, what was once a beautiful friendship and a genuine pure love had become miserable for both of us. We were miserable. We hated our lives. We hated our marriage. It was a train wreck. And a year and a half into it, Amy filed for divorce. I can't do it anymore. I didn't blame her. But I remember when I lost her, how all of a sudden, man, I saw what I had lost. I saw what a, a good thing a wife is. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing, amen? <laughs> yeah. And I, for the first time in my whole life, I began to see something inside of me I never recognized before, but it was a void, a void in my life, a void deep down in my heart. And I, I went into the world to try to fill it. I began using drugs, meth and cocaine and ecstasy and abusing alcohol and living a party lifestyle and living in the world, believing that would satisfy and fulfill. But the more I did it, the more empty I became, the more hopeless I became, the more lost I was. Two years into our divorce, I had reached the end of my rope. I couldn't do it anymore. So I got down on my knees one night in my living room. I couldn't keep living like that. So I cried out. I wish I could tell you I cried out to Jesus, but I didn't. I said, I gotta find Amy. If I can just get her back, that'll be enough. She'll complete me. She'll satisfy. I found out where she was at, went to the house, knocked on the door, begged her best friend. I said, you gotta get Amy. I gotta see her. I need to just hear her voice. I gotta see her face one more time. I gotta hold her hand. I gotta, I gotta see her again. And that night, Amy said, I never wanna see him. I want him to leave and stay out of my life. And I remember how I felt at that moment. You know, all my friends thought I had it made. I had 60 grand in the bank, brand new sports car, brand new house, brand new truck, success in boxing, worldwide success in boxing, silver medal at the Goodwill Games, the Madison Square Gardens. None of it satisfied. It all left me empty. And I got in my car and I began driving home and thinking about the life I had dreamed of. I tried to do it my way and it didn't work. I got home and sat on the side of my bed and I began to think about all the dreams I had. Dreams of boxing success. You know, at that moment, I had nothing in me to fight. I didn't have any, I had no fight in me. I'd never box again, I was done. I began to think about the, the marriage that I had dreamed of. Amy was done with me. And then I began to think about the children we picked out names for. I began to imagine taking them to a playground and pushing them on the swings and calling them by name. And I knew at that moment those kids would never exist. I knew they were a, they were a pipe dream, man. They would never exist. I knew it. And I reached in the nightstand and I pulled out a 40 caliber pistol and I put it to my head and I was ready to end my life. I wanted to die. But as I started to pull the trigger, something amazing happened. I heard a small, still voice that said, Ebo, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. If you don't quit, if you just give me your life, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all the worm is eaten. I'll restore all that you've lost. I'll give, I'll give you more than you can ever imagine. If you just come to me, I'll give you hope. I'll give you meaning, I'll give you purpose. I'll give you all the things you've dreamed of if you just come to me. And at that moment, for the first time in a long time, I began to have hope. Do you need hope? Maybe you need hope tonight. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our hope. I put the gun down. At that moment, I began making decisions to choose Jesus instead of myself to turn toward him instead of away, to yield to his spirit instead of resisting his spirit. And soon after that, God began a great work in my life. He put me back into boxing, took me to number five world ranking, gave me three championship belts, put me on a reality show in 2006 called The Contender on ESPN. In January 2007, God calls me out of boxing and throws me into a life of itinerant evangelism and ministry. 
His plans are not our plans. His ways are not our ways. Amen to that. But I'm so thankful I'm with you guys tonight because there's no better place to be than the will of God. No better place. Pretty soon after that, the Lord began working in Amy's heart. That girl that was fed up and done and tired and hurt and broken, she came back into my life. This coming April will be 18 years remarried. <laughs> and those kids, those kids we had names picked out for, we got them too. We got Maddie, Abby, Gabby, and Addie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so listen, your greatest comeback is not a boxing comeback. Your greatest comeback is not a financial comeback. Your greatest comeback is not a emotional or a, a circumstantial comeback. Your greatest comeback is coming back to Jesus. That is your greatest comeback. I believe tonight there are some of us we need to come back to Jesus. It may be a first time, it may, it may not. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've allowed something in your life, something is separating you, pushing him away. You're resisting him. You're not yielding to his call. Maybe it's a marriage that needs to come back and you need to come back to Jesus, man. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. Colossians chapter one says that all things were made for him, through him, and by him, and in him, all things are held together. If there's anything falling apart in your life, I can guarantee you it's because Jesus is not the center of it. Why don't you come back? I wanna give an invitation to you right now. The Lord blesses this. I guarantee you the Lord blesses it when we step out and say, hey, I need you, Lord like Abraham at the tent, running to Jesus, running to the Lord, expectantly knowing he wanted to work in the, his life. God blesses it. If you're here tonight and say, you know what? I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to surrender my life. I want to make my mind up once and for all. I'm giving it all to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and come to the altars with me. We're going to pray together. And Lord, I ask right now that you would give courage and give strength to whomever needs it. If you need a great comeback in your life, now's the time to come with expectancy, to come saying, Lord, I know you want to work. I know you want to transform my life. Come on, guys. Come on. Amen. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Amen, amen. Amen. Come on, guys. Right now you sit there and a battle's raging in your heart. A battle's raging in your heart and you're going, oh, I need to go. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Don't do like me and go, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. If the Lord is is it's calling you right now. It's tugging on your heart for a great comeback. Maybe it's a first time salvation. You're giving your life to him. Maybe you just need God to do a work in your life. If that's you, get up. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, we know that you are the God of the great comeback. And 2,000 years ago, you had the greatest comeback in all of eternity when you went upon a cross, paid the price for our sins, were buried in a tomb, and three days later, you rose again. The greatest comeback in all of eternity. And Lord, right now, we place our faith in you. We place our faith in the work of the cross, that when you said it is finished, it was finished. And Lord, you have, you have the victory, the victory is yours. But Father, we know you offer us to, to share in your victory by abiding in you, 
by knowing you and walking with you. And Lord, right now, these that have come forward and there are many here that maybe they didn't have the, the, the didn't get out of their seats, that's okay. But there are many here that are saying, Lord, I need you. I need a great comeback. Father, pour your spirit out right now, I ask. Maybe it's a comeback in a marriage, a circumstance, a, a situation. We lift all these prayers up to you, all the comebacks, we lift them up to you, God. For these here, uh, maybe there's some here that have never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, given their life to him. Right now, you can pray with me in your heart, pray with me out loud if you want. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're, you're the Savior, the greatest Savior. You gave your life for me. And I receive the gift of salvation. And I give you my life. It's no longer my life, but Lord, it is yours. Use me for your glory. Use me for great things, for your purposes. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, we've got a prayer team. If the prayer team, each of you guys, if you if you if you pray to receive Christ for the first time or maybe recommitting your life, share that with someone. Share that with a pastor. Share it with someone you're close to. Share it. Don't be quiet about it. And maybe you have something you need a great comeback in. Maybe it's your marriage, maybe a situation. Whatever that is, share with a pastor. Talk to somebody. Let's, we want to be praying for you. We're here for you. And uh, most importantly, I believe God is doing a work tonight. You hear me? You agree? Is God doing a work? Amen. 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 At Coastal, we believe it's our mission to connect our community to Christ. So if the message impacted you in any way, we would like to invite you to share this message with family and friends. We'll see you next week.